afternoon from New York, presenting today two leading progressives <laughs> in the fight to unthrone Trump and uh, lead our country into a saner position through greater empathy and awareness, which is the goal of this channel, whether you're using it within your own inner reflections and imagination, or whether you're using it outside to make a better world. And I can't imagine somebody making a better world without doing both. So that is a progressive. We might define a progressive also as someone who is practical, who knows what's going to get the job done. And to that, I would like to introduce you to Mike Rollins, a great political activist and organizer, and to a very bright young lady, Alyssa Salamander, who gets everything Mike and I say and uh, adds inf information on top of it, uh, a solid member of our team. And we hope that uh, you like all of us because you're going to see us a lot. So, uh, yeah. And uh, tonight's uh, subject will begin with uh, Mike's presentation. Take it away, Mike. Okay, thanks, Mitch. Uh, greetings to all from Richardson, Texas, a suburb north of Dallas. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I was, uh, in, in terms of the relevance to this channel, uh, I was county chair of the sixth largest county in Texas, that is, chair of the county Democratic Party in the sixth largest county in Texas for eight years. Uh, before that, a precinct chair for 10 years and pretty much got my fingers worked in uh, nearly every aspect of politics from a, from a party perspective. Uh, learned a lot over those those years from a lot of smart people and from making a lot of mistakes. So, <laughs> uh, I met Mitch through... Uh, I think a county convention probably 20 years ago. Uh, and we have a shared interest in politics and we have talked a lot about, about, about the concepts that he has been covering on this channel. So we wanted to start exploring today the kind of the overall interaction and application of some of these concepts to the political realm. Uh, especially in terms of motivating people to vote, motivating them to activate, activism, and motivating them to vote a particular way. So uh, I'd, I'd like to just kind of start off with this by, uh, I think a lot of you mirrored what my experience was. And that is, we, we get into politics thinking that we are going to persuade, motivate people based on issues and based on self-interest. Um, the fact is, and the data shows this, that while that might be true for some people, for most of the population, it isn't. What the science shows us is that people behave in the political realm, especially in terms of voting, whether they vote or not and how they vote, on based on their identity, their values, and their feelings. Uh, <clears throat> it tends to be more irrational than rational, which kind of makes sense considering uh, you know, the vast majority of people out there who would watch a video like this who aren't interested in politics and the great number of them who don't actually even vote, don't give a lot of thought to issues or how government affects them. What they do is they re respond to basic, uh, for want of a better term, lizard brain appeals to their identity, who they think they are, to their social circles, to their emotions, whatever they might be feeling at the time. So, that kind of gets to uh, the whole role of empathy. Uh, I was at a state party, Texas state party meeting, oh, six or eight years ago, and the chairman was talking to a lot of us county chairs, and he says, what differentiates Democrats from Republicans is empathy. We have empathy. 
And I kind of came aw came away from thinking it, <clears throat> that meeting, thinking, yeah, that's right. On the other hand, I don't think it's so simple as that. Um, the kind of th empathy he was talking about was like a politician or you know an activist, somebody knocking on their door saying, I understand how you feel. It kind of gets back to Bill Clinton's famous comment, I feel your pain. That's one thing. <clears throat> um, I think a more powerful form of empathy is actually not just saying, I feel your pain, but doing something concrete to address it, to listening them to them express their pain and you echoing that back to them. Uh, that's where we get into the more effective types of canvassing. And I say there, there's different ways you can play on that empathy too and the whole importance of emotions and the more soft stuff in politics. Uh, and like in 2008, after eight years of what a lot of us felt was kind of a bleak period under George W. Bush's presidency, Obama came on with a very positive message of hope. Uh, and a lot of people felt great about that. Uh, that motivated a lot of people to action to get out and help and vote. It's kind of set a different mood in the country. On the other hand, there was a people who didn't like a group of people, segment of the population, who didn't like his politics, who, you know, more and more openly started expressing the idea they didn't like a black man being president. And a lot of that backlash helped get he who I shall not name elected in 2016. And you can say, it's very easy to say, Obama practiced empathy and really resonated with him. His message resonated with him. But on the other hand, you can't say that the other guy didn't because he was responding to some of their baser emotions, their fear of being replaced, of other people doing better than they were when they were working real hard and <clears throat> they were afraid of other people getting handouts that they weren't getting. Uh, it was appealing to their, a lot of them, I'm sorry, their sense of greed. Uh, their sense of moral outrage that uh, there's an old joke about uh, you know what's what's wrong with Puritans they're afraid of somebody else having more fun than they are so it's um, it kind of gets into a more complicated topic and I would recommend for maybe a, a later discussion on this channel or if you want to study some more on it uh, shortly after the 2004 election, when um, W got reelected, there's a guy named, I don't remember his name, I'll put the links to both of these books in the comments when we get the video posted. But uh, <clears throat> there, there was a guy who wrote a book called What's the Matter with Kansas? And what he did was documented um, the shift of uh, in particular, a bunch of union workers who traditionally voted Democratic, <clears throat> who worked for Boyne in Wichita, Kansas, from voting their union direction, supporting the Democratic Party, to starting to vote Republicans, because the Republicans in the 70s and the 80s, when the Soviet Union started, you know, being less of the boogeyman, uh, they needed another issue to gin people up, so they picked abortion. And they motivated the, these union workers to picket abortion clinics and start voting for candidates who uh, were against abortion. Uh, that's one example of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, there, it, it was an appeal to their sense of moral outrage, uh, in a sense, and their sense of values, not really to self-interest because if they wanted to keep voting for their self-interest, they would vote for the party that supported them as unions. Uh, the guy who wrote this book, I thought it was an unsatisfying book because he described this, this phenomena, but he didn't know what caused it and he didn't know how to address it. There was another book that came off uh, about the same time that's gotten a lot of traction 
a book by uh, a guy named George Lakoff called "What uh, Don't Think of an Elephant. And if you remember the work that a um, guy named Frank Luntz did with um, uh, Newt Gingrich and the Republican Caucus in the 90s, where they started using different terms for everything. Uh, and they put a name on that called reframing the issue. Like instead of a state tax, which everybody understood as an, a, 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 a tax on the money that was left over after somebody died, they called it a death tax. Uh, like, why should anybody be taxed for dying? Um, and that's just one example of the kind of language that they're using. And Lankoff talked a lot about that. And he talked about, <clears throat> oh, it was important that if you're trying to convince somebody or persuade them to let go of the framing that isn't favorable to your cause, you, you can't use the language that they did. You cannot start saying a death tax is a good thing because as soon as you say death tax, they'll think we're taxing people when they die. You want to go back to calling it an estate tax. Uh, it's same thing, you know, they started calling Social Security and Medicare entitlements, like you were entitled to them, to them whether you did anything or not. What they actually are is old age insurance and old age medical insurance. Uh, and if you start calling them that, uh, the preferred phrase in these days is earned benefits. It's not a giveaway that you're entitled to. This is something you earn throughout your working career by paying money into it under taxes. Then uh, that is invokes more the, the kind of thinking about the issue that we want to. Uh, and he also, Lankoff also talks about two different models of viewing the world. One is a, a strict authoritarian father model where the father provides security, stability, and sets down the rules and everybody follows along. The other model is more the nurturing mother, which in the context of our discussion today is more reflective of the empathetic model where the mother understands what you're feeling, provides nurturing and more concerned with dealing with your needs, your real needs, rather than responding to your fears. So that uh, to kind of wrap up, that is kind of the overall framework in which um, we have been approaching things in general in, in politics for the last several years. Uh, <clears throat> it's, I think the party as a whole has taken a little while uh, to really digest Lakoff's work and to use it effectively. We still find a lot of politicians running for office who, you know, try to talk about entitlements, you know, a Democrat talking about entitlements when they shouldn't even be using that word, they should be using earned benefits. So it's kind of a hard sell sometimes, but uh, it's very important. Uh, and uh, I'll close this and then leave it off to, to Mitch and Alyssa for some follow-up questions and impressions that uh, I worked off and on with a very respected political consultant in the Dallas area who was, had a lot of credit for flipping Dallas from red to blue in 2006 and has been pretty much the go-to guy for getting most of the jud judges elected in Dallas County and some statewide, worked on some statewide campaigns too. Uh, and he has maintained that you know, TV advertising, yard signs, flyers and stuff are marginally effective. And the, the data shows this, uh, you know, they might give you one or two percentage points in a close race. And he says, he knows what the most effective thing to do is, but getting politicians to divert their money from direct mail to and TV ads and stuff to actually do something that's effective is kind of a hard sell. And what is it that he says is most effective? Uh, from his tests and polling, 
Uh, that was for you actually knock on a door and take the time to have a real conversation with somebody. Uh, that's not going to work on everybody. Uh, you know, if you like a, I were to knock on the door of a very hardcore conservative, you know, going back Tea Party, John Birch Society, and now a maggot, uh, I'd be wasting my time talking to him. Their their mind is closed. But if I'm talking to somebody who is, you know, marginally engaged, kind of gets the news on the late night talk shows or sees the headlines and, you know, or hears the headlines on the radio when they drive to work, and they have the time to talk, then taking time to have a real conversation, you know, asking some kind of probing and follow-up questions like what's important to you, and then talking about their concerns, their issues, identity in ways that resonate with them that reflect the candidate you're working for. Uh, that's the most effective thing you can do. Uh, the data shows that it's just the problem is in practical politics, it's very hard to do. You are, it's hard to train volunteers to do it and get enough volunteers to do it effectively. Uh, it costs money to pay people. Then you have to have another level of staff to manage that effort. Um, but I, I think if we want to make an impact bigger than just letting the the overall narrative play out as it will, um, then we have to do something like that. So that kind of leads into more practical applications as some of, some of the stuff that Mitch and I have talked about from time to time about his experiences with like sitting down with somebody in a laundromat and, and getting to know them and getting them interested in politics or at least a little broader world out there than they had thought about. So what do you guys think about all this? Go ahead, Lucas. Oh, me? First? Okay. Um, I don't know if it's, are you hearing me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's uh, really interesting. I think um, from my experience, you know, a lot of the people that I, I meet online, mostly because I don't really meet a lot of uh, right wing conservatives in person, um, besides some of my family members, but um, <laughs> there's definitely a big uh, religious aspects to it. Um, I find that that's a big, um, it could be used in a really good way, or it could be a huge hurdle if somebody doesn't want to talk about that sort of thing. Um, especially like a lot of, I think left-wing people are less religious or, um, even have some animosity towards religion. So, um, I think, trying to find that common ground though with people and yeah, but I, 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 I don't have a lot of experience with doing any sort of actual political activism in you know, the type you're talking about, Mike. So it's really interesting to learn about that um, in that regard of, of things that have been done and how kind of what the party, the democratic party has been using um, but I do think at this point in time, almost like what Mi what appealed to me a lot about what Mitch talks about on his channel is the way he um, incorporates the empathy in a kind of um, metaphysical way, I guess you could say, or, or just bringing it up in a in that context with um, even bringing up Jesus and um, some of his teachings um, that really even though I'm left wing, it appealed to me. And I can imagine that that could appeal to someone who, like you said, Mike, who's kind of more in the middle, more marginal or, or having some um, questions about the current state of, you know, for instance, MAGA and those, that group, <laughs> it's just sure. too, it's so extreme. Um, so yeah, Mitch, I guess I'm uh, curious what you have to say. Okay. 
Uh, what I what I would say is that I find that it all begins before you even have words. When I'm approaching somebody, if I, I have a certain attitude which will show on my face, which communicates better than words, uh, if I approach them with extreme compassion and, uh, and a feeling of uh, this is a wonder before my eyes, this amazing other person with a human brain this is this is wonderful and i can learn so much from this person and if you come approach them with that kind of face you've made a connection it's like uh like when people are dating and they say they i i loved her at first sight you know or i loved him at first sight you know they 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 connected with their eyes and their and so much about a person is communicated and the way they move and then you know watch them for a while before you approach somebody if it's in public watch them for a little while and see if they've got time and so on like at a laundromat or anything like that and uh, i'll give an experience that i had because people like stories you know that's another thing mm -hmm. <laughs> they love stories so one time i was i was always evangelizing for the party you know i i didn't go door to door but I would talk to so many different people in, in parking lots and laundromats. And, you know, when I'd go out to eat and, uh, so there were, there was one time I went to, uh, this laundromat and I, I spotted a fellow. I says, well, there's a possibility there. I says, you know, something about him says to me, he might be a cop. Most cops vote Republican. And then I thought about it and I said, eh, there's still something about it. So I went over and I talked to him and it, he told me he worked in IT. I says, okay. And, you know, and, uh, you know, and I found out later that he had been a cop in Dallas. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes your instincts are right, you know? So, uh, but, you know, it, you know, he ended up uh, becoming a precinct chair and running mm. for congress mm. and so you know another another you know oh the, i think i know who you're talking about yeah mm. should we say his name yeah no okay <laughs> you might not want that i don't know uh, uh, he's one of those people who probably shouldn't have run for congress but that's a whole nother discussion well it's all i i always look at it like you know it's it's never put limitations on people and, and well that's yeah, true yeah, they let them go ahead and try. They, oh, yeah. You know, if they fail, they've learned something, you know. Yeah. You know, it's like if you never tried talking to anybody about politics, try it. Sure. Uh, but, you know, this is this is like I'm saying, it's it's all about that empathy. And as, as Alyssa pointed out about Jesus, I mean, I was raised Christian and that echoes in me all the time. And I paid attention to what Jesus said supposedly as uh, and uh, uh, the mainstream of what it's all about more than i i paid attention to specific things that uh say the apostle paul said where oh. he said that uh that overweight people and people who were gay were that way because they were worshiping demons uh you know and uh, little 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 odd things like that but what what's the main thrust i mean the great mystics of the world, and this is where it branches over into any other uh, religion. Uh, and yeah, I use great mystics as a source because the great mystics of the world, and, and I include the, the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, Nelson Mandela and Mahatma Gandhi, who in a peaceful way, really reached people and and moved them toward a higher moral ground and uh and toward independence from oppression so i see that and i'm like that's that's an important message a lot of things that jesus said were you know totally ignored now by the maga folk you know they they're not paying attention they is anything socialist is is bad to them 
-hmm. even though all it means is that it's something for the common good that's paid for by taxes. That's that's it. In practical terms, that's right. <laughs> they they demonized socialism just like they demonized liberals. Exactly. Right. So that that thing is, you know, it's good to point out and and then sometimes they go a little upset. But, you know, I point out that uh, that Jesus was very much a socialist. You know, it, it, the love of money was the root of all evil for him. Yeah, you if know? you read the Acts of Apostles, uh, they were like the first communists. Yes. <laughs> the, the first, in common. Yes, exactly. The first church in, in Acts was, uh, was a... a uh, was an example of that. I hope that that that. Oh God, he's got Alexa going over there. Um, yeah, pardon. Um, yeah, the first uh, church that was ever formed. It was exactly what Mike said, Alyssa. It's it's they had everything in common, so that nobody would be without. And uh, Ananias came before the apostles, claiming that he gave up everything he had. And he says, wasn't it yours to begin with? You didn't have to join us, more or less. Is what is it? it was yours to begin with. But you've lied. You haven't lied to us. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. And he was struck dead and dragged out. Oh, and yeah. his wife, Sapphira, comes in with the same story. And he says, those who came for your husband now come for you. Uh, you know, so <laughs> that sounds, you know, whether you like uh, that degree of communism, which was only a dream. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you, you know, you know, or you don't, uh, don't base your hatred for socialism on the, on the, on the New Testament. Um, <laughs> you can't do it. And, uh, you know, well, Jesus, there are people who do. <laughs> they do, but they're ignoring what what's said there. Right. <laughs> you know, they don't do you do critical reading, uh, like when when Jesus told the rich man, young man, uh, you know, he wants to. I want to follow you, and he says, "Okay, give up everything you've got and uh, help the poor, and follow me." And uh, he he went away sorrowful because he had great wealth. Right. And Jesus uh, also said with the old the famous thing where how hard it is for a rich one uh, man to enter into heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And they've tried to talk around that so many different ways. You know, like it isn't that quite a, extreme. Uh, uh, a needle might have referred to this 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 uh, mm -hmm. gateway where right. where mm -hmm. the where the camel had to get on its knees to get through because it was a defensive kind of door right. mm -hmm. and <laughs> so, so you know and i'm going yeah well that's that that's that's a statement it's still of the same idea yeah it's still the same idea it's humility you know you know it's 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 you know right that's you know, really lacking <laughs> the yeah, humility is really lacking with some of the leaders <laughs> Right yeah, um, we're we're getting close to to thirty minutes. I I, I kind of like to just respond to in to some of the general comments you guys both made about religion, and then we can kind of wrap it up. Uh, and then continue this discussion, you know, the next week or two. Um, about the time I really started getting active, about you know after the two thousand four election when W got reelected, um, and there were uh, I, I was brought up in the Episcopal Church, still somewhat active. Um, the there was this thing going around with Kerry being refused communion in Catholic churches because he supported abortion rights. And there were a lot of people on, on the right wing saying you can't be a Christian and a Democrat. And I thought, well, that's BS. Uh, so I started getting more into investigating the Christian left. Um, and I found out two things from that. 
Um, one is that uh, this is from personal experience, trying to establish a dialogue with uh, somebody in my family where I I had read a book, I think guy by a name called Jim Wallace called Gaunt's Politics, which talked very much along the lines of what Mitch was just talking about with <clears throat> relating the more progressive and liberal social and political outlet to, to the New Testament. And I sent this to this person in my family and the response I got back was disappointing and surprising. Uh, they dismissed it as this is just talking the social gospel. This is not really well founded in scripture. And uh, it kind of hit me like a baseball bat then that this divide is not just about politics. There is a very deep gulf within people with strong, with any kind of um, involvement in, in organized religion. Uh, and, and you can really see it now with some of the churches that people go to. Some of the more conservative Bible churches, I mean, their, their pastors actually preach to their congregations about their people being persecuted and under attack, and they have to arm themselves and defend themselves to attacks by the world, and that these other people are evil, and, and you know, just, you know, you can imagine. And then you have other churches that, uh, while they are scripturally based, they more react to or preach to people to uh, follow in the footsteps of Jesus, to behave as he behaved, and they're not so concerned about how you believe. Uh, you're supposed to exercise love. I mean, that was the big that was the one new commandment that he gave to people. And mm -hmm. if you really delve into it, you know, like I say, you find a lot of people on the left are less dogmatic, theological. They don't really care as much what you believe. They care how you act. They, they care that you practice empathy. They care how you treat other people. They care how the government treats other people. They look at, you know, intended and unintended consequences of government programs. Whereas on the extreme right wing of religion and politics, you find a lot of images and people talking about Jesus, you know, coming back with his army to rout out the evil doers and establish the kingdom uh, on earth when they kind of miss the you know, in the gospel, Jesus was saying, my kingdom is not of this earth. And, you know, when, when he sent out the apostles, he, he was telling them, said, the kingdom of God has come near you. Uh, so it's a very fundamental difference in how they view uh, Jesus in particular. And I think you can probably find similar elements in Islam and Hinduism and any of the other religions big enough to have more conservative and more liberal worldviews, more dogmatic and uh, authoritarian versus more open and loving. So that's, I think, how that kind of relates to what both of you are saying. So mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that for my closing thoughts. See if you guys have any closing thoughts before we wrap up. Well, I think it's very hard to argue against love. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's that's uh, even in science, you know, just looking at it as meeting real human needs. All of our virtues are based on forms of empathy, objective empathy, truth, compassionate empathy, goodness. And from creative empathy, we have artfulness the ability to see mm -hmm. or get outside of ourselves outside of our whole story of our life in a sense in a place where there is no time where you're looking down on your life and seeing how it goes i notice as i do certain practices i have the life reviews that the people have in the ndes that i'm looking at how i behaved and i'm going that's not right or I need to improve that. 
um, you know, it's this inner reflection is powerful. Uh, it it has a resonance with with all of the great mystics uh, of the world, and especially the things that Jesus had to say, and uh, that uh, they teach in uh, in Hinduism as well, uh, with the Paramatma, the super soul um, that supposedly lives in us. Well, that is to me the art artist within us. And we have a dialogue with that part of us that is the creative empathy. We have a dialogue with the compassionate empathy. Uh, that's the caregiver in us. And a, comp and a communication with uh, the co inner counselor, which is the objective empathy in us. And having these kinds of conversations help us to grow in empathy in ways that only we would know uh, is the right approach for us. Uh, we learn from outside, but other people shouldn't push. And uh, the great mystics do not talk about punishment. We, they, Jesus taught that uh, the person, people that were doing bad things were hurting people. These were people who need healing. And so what is at the root of this love of money? It is the helplessness that occurs around needs, feelings, and your condition as a result of trauma, whether it's uh, complex PTSD or PTSD, uh, these things hurt people. And so you, the process toward a, uh, for the big world view is to become, a, in, the, in the moral sense, more spiritual, uh, learning, going back and, and reliving in these discussions, and there are other things that we'll cover on another time, uh, going through these uh, inner dialogues, we find that through this attempt to comfort ourselves, we learn to unlearn helplessness around feeling and knowing and feeling what really happened to us. And once we do that, then the real needs underneath that, which we were, your, our brain hid, hid from us because it brought up so much anxiety because you were helpless. Um, it gave us symbol, symbolic uh, forms of the need and the circumstances that you would uh, prefer and that... Uh, give you more sense of control and that you can feel I can, I can reach that. Right. Uh, and it gets rid of that deep anxiety. When you're in that deep anxiety, the drama, the drama has you instead of you having the drama. And that's a bad thing. When you unlearn the helplessness, it's then that you realize, Hey, there's these needs and they weren't met. Right. That's when you need, you can grieve and let those things go. And uh, when you let them go, then as you can be more forgiving of the people involved. Right. I, I think that's a great segue and introduction to maybe our next conversation. It's more how we tell these, these concepts that you're talking about really form the foundation of being able to more effectively reach out to other people. Because kind of to put it another way, if you want to you can be more effective at reaching out and connecting with each other pe other people if you have your own house in order first. Or if you yeah. learn how to reach out to yourself. Yes. With love. Right. That's very good. Right. And I agree about the forgiveness specifically, Mitch. I just wanted to say real quick that the forgiveness is really important because if, for instance, you're harboring resentment towards people in your life that hurt you, you're going to have a really hard time having empathy towards anyone, especially people that disagree with you, or maybe they trigger something in you that reminds you of um, a person that you're still angry with. So you're going to act towards them the way that you feel. And you can't hide that. Like Mitch was saying about having that true genuine feeling of love towards someone, it, it shows on your face and it shows on the way you come across to them and they can sense that, you know, even 
someone who's really closed minded will they might not even consciously realize that you know they can sense the way that you feel about them and the way that you're coming at them so i do think uh, that's really important yeah and, good observation and to just to tap that off the the and make it all sensible uh the the hardest thing to do and it takes all of these stages to kind of get there is the point of remorse. The time that you realize that you were the monster, you were the criminal, you were the bad guy who did these things. And then you have real remorse for that because you've got that pain out of you. Mm -hmm. And now you're having this, this feeling of remorse. And the beautiful thing about that uh, is that once you have that remorse, you realize you're no longer the person who did that bad thing. Right. And you are born again. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it sounds like a great point to wrap up today. And let's uh, use all that as this kind of a springboard for where we continue next time. So thank you, both of you. Thanks, Mitch, for inviting me to come on. Uh, nice talking to both of you. And we'll uh, end the recording here. Well, 